Uh, welcome to our Naropa Community Gathering, another course in our feast of 40th anniversary uh, celebrations. Um, I'm supposed to welcome Reb Solomon, but it's funny to welcome him to a place that's his own. So basically, I'm acknowledging that Reb Zalman has come home again, uh, something that we are delighted uh, always. Um, Reb Zalman this year is celebrating his 90th birthday. Um, <laughs> Which is quite remarkable because I, I kind of I thought I was going to be the only person hanging around a rope at 90, and it's very good that there's now another person who is leading the way. Um, I was going to talk about his his bio, but I'm actually not going to do that. So people can kind of f figure that out because in 90 years, there's it's hard to know what the highlights are. But I think important to say that. Um, uh, what Reb Zalman has done through his life, particularly in bringing um, the streams of Judaism and the creation of the Jewish Renewal Movement to uh, the Buddhist tradition uh, here at Naropa and also around the world through dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and through work with a number of other uh, Tibetan teachers over the years has been this powerful, created this sort of powerful alchemy uh, something that uh, within Naropa's uh, programs and departments now we are benefiting from and trying to deepen and actually go further. Um, for some of us, um, I, was thinking, I was thinking this morning that uh, in 1970 I was at this Tale of the Tiger, now Karma Chilling, this Buddhist meditation center in Vermont, and I was 19 years old and a rabbi arrived to basically try and talk the Jewish people at Tail of the Tiger in le to leave um, and sort of come back, I don't know, come back to what, but basically to leave. And he wasn't all that compelling. And I realized today when I was thinking about it, if Reb Zalman had shown up, I'm not sure I would be here exactly, or maybe I would be Tzvi and I would be teaching as a rabbi, I don't know. So, uh, I would just said hyphenated. That's true. Could be. Uh, but basically, the most important thing I think to say is really represented by, by the stage here is that uh, the mind of Reb Zalman and the mind of our founder, Trump Rinpoche, are really one. And I think that the fact that this was Reb Zalman's staging and choreography uh, tells that uh, story really beautifully. And uh, so, with that, uh, welcome home and please address us. We did the bow, and now I would like you to sit with me for a few minutes in silence. To tune in to making space for the task for which we took a body this time around and to see what, in today's presentation, would help you with that. So we will focus on this a little bit in silence, and honor also the founder. I'll tell you more about him later. Okay, here we start.
Amen. Om Mani Padme Hum. And all these good things. <laughs> 39 years ago, summer, when you got married, I was here this summer to teach. It was an amazing summer. And I had the opportunity of being with Rinpoche. He had an amazing range. There were times he was in very deep and profound places. And there were times when he just loved to joke around. Here I'm on Friday night in the hall where we were with my Hasidic outfit, the fur hat and the, and the coat. And he sits and suddenly he says, you know, my son asked me whether there's a God. And I said, no. And my son went, <laughs> And then he looks over to me and, no. <laughs> Are you going to take me up on that? And I said, Rinpoche, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. <laughs> because that's, that's really where both of us were, you know. He was breaking the mold, I was breaking the mold. Uh, there was a moment when I needed from him something very, how would I say, magical, liturgical. And we came into his office and he took the dorje and, and you know, the, the implements that are there. And from there drew a blessing for me. So it's amazing the range in which I experienced him. When he taught, I always had the sense that he was in touch with what he was saying and not just with the ideas, with, with, the, with the concepts of it. So Mazel Tov Rinpoche, you did a good job. <laughs> we are still here. A detour. You know, at 90, I don't have to be giving an academic lecture with footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm entitled to have my, to share, you know, the, 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 the fruits of my reflections with you. And this is what I'm doing. So, there was this meeting that we had in Vancouver. Bishop Tutu, his Rinpoche, sorry, uh, His Holiness was there, and I tried to get him alone for a while, very hard. When it looked that I had him alone, there were four or five people in the room, and so it wasn't possible to say very much. Among the things I asked him at that time, I said, you were just at Madison Square Garden, initiating the people into the Kala Chakra Mandala. It's like saying, uh, you know, you take people into the prayer of Yom Kippur. What did you have in mind in order to raise? He doesn't want to go into any woo-woo stuff. He does it, but he doesn't want to talk about it. So he says, I had the opportunity to teach for three days, and that's what I wanted. Then I asked him, isn't it time that you should proclaim the fourth turning of the Buddhist wheel? The first one is the Theravada, basic teachings of the Buddha. Second, Mahayana, China and Japan, Vajrayana in Tibet. And if we were to go back over up 200 years to Tibet, White people were not very welcome at that time there. And here goes the Dalai Lama and he's teaching everybody and, and brings it into the world. So I 
felt it's time to proclaim the fourth turning of the wheel. He says to me, for this you need to have Gautama himself, which was a very beautiful and humble statement to make. But if nobody else were there, I would have said, tense in Garcia, don't, don't, don't push it away from yourself. It's your job, your job to do. Because there is something happening, and I'm going to say, he did it. He took Vajrayana and added to it, and my mind, I, I wrote it down, because I know I was going to forget the name of it, the Shambhava training, and along with that, there's another good word that he used before Shambhava training. Help me out with it. Vajudata. Yeah. So, what did he do here? When I was talking with the Dalai Lama in uh, Dharamsala, from time to time he would turn back to the Geshe sitting behind him and, he, and talk with them a little bit, explain, and, and, and when they would nod, he said, they're orthodox, but they agree with me. <laughs> that was his way of saying that he still had to look to make sure that people will not see him changing the tradition. Along comes Rinpoche here. He doesn't worry about changing the tradition. He is interested that the software, the mind soft software, the soul software, should be made available to people. And if you don't mind, to create an update on it too. <laughs> he was not afraid to learn from other Buddhist traditions, and I remember when he had this golden thing that he wore over here, which he sort of purlined from the, from the Zen people. <laughs> but it's okay, you know, I'm, I'm the same kind of a Ganesh in Judaism too. <laughs> because Something has happened. We saw the picture of Earth from outer space. And when that happened, it took away from most religions, or from most people of religions, the notion of triumphalism. Triumphalism was always the thing that they thought before. Mashiach will come and all the going will find out they were wrong and that we were right all along. <laughs> there will be the second coming and you Jews will find out why didn't you listen to me the first time. <laughs> the Mahdi is going to come and he's going to show the people who did not, did not surrender to the teachings of Allah and so on and so forth. It goes the last avatar. Everybody had something to say about that. And now it's not tenable to say it this way. Because we know that we are cells of a larger planet and that this view of seeing ourselves in this larger way demands that we check all the other ways in which we handled our religion. This morning I had a conversation with a techie uh, from Nuance about my dragon. I wanted him to change a piece of software over there. And he told me he couldn't do it. <clears throat> Why couldn't he do it? Because the basis of that software that they had created doesn't allow for that. So why is software called software? <laughs> <laughs> it's not firmware. You can change it. That's the whole business. You can change it only if you understand the system files. If you have experienced what the books are saying about what kind of a mind you have to have. And if you follow greed or if you follow other things, the likelihood is you are not going to get to the truth. 
how wonderful it is to know these words, but then if you go deeper and you find out what's going on inside the regions of possibilities that are Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, you can go to these places and Rupsvi can teach you about the Sifirot and the worlds and so on and so forth, how in Kabbalah we talk about it. There are some people who know the words of that, and the words are good words, but they don't understand how it came about that we have the words. One of the stories we have about the person who was the last great voice in the Kabbalah, Rabbi Isaac Luria, is that one Shabbos afternoon he took a nap, and when he got up from the nap 20 minutes later, his disciple who stood next to him asked, what did you dream? He says, it would take me 20 years to teach you what I saw in my dream. Why is that? Because the soul can be, can handle paradox. But for the, what for the left hemisphere looks like a contradiction, is for the right hemisphere a big aha. That's how they fit together. It's so, so, so different how this operates. So if you know it from having experienced it, then you know what the words mean. And then you can go into the software and you can change things, and you can bring them up to date so that people in Boulder will be able to learn at a school and still attain as they can, as close to that awareness, to that level of vibration. How wonderful that is. While I was preparing this, I asked myself, Look again at the Four Noble Truths. Now when I say Four Noble Truths, you know, if you, you have them already laid out like in, you know, in the candy store, this and this and this, like, a, like in a buffet. But when I unpacked it, and then said I want to look at it all at once, it's such a shock when you get to the place that there is no end to suffering, that the cause of suffering is our ignorance. How come that we got to ignorance? Because every time we went to school and we dealt with our parents, they were sharing with us how to present ourselves decently in public. So we had learned what there was that even in a less than conscious way, we have to work at the presentation of self, how we present ourselves to the world. And that's how we grew an ego and identified ourselves with that creation that we have created, how we present ourselves to the world. When someone tries to shatter that mask, we get very upset. But part of the homework of anybody who works on the inside, whether it's in Hasidism, Kabbalah, whether it's in Buddhism or Hinduism or in Sufism, wherever you go, when you work on the inside, you can't help but dismantle that kind of ego a bit. And when you see that suffering, because everybody attacks that picture that we have of ourselves, the self-made being. There's the person who said, about someone, he, is a, he was a self-made man and he worshipped his maker. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, when I think of Abraham and breaking the idols, I think that's what we are talking about. If you work on the inside, you have to break those idols 
this is how I present myself to these people, this is how I present myself in that situation, and so it has to change. When you let the suffering of ignorance hit you, most of us are so well protected. But I felt it gave me a real zets, you know, a real, real break. Wow! So many people are suffering. So many people need to learn, learn how not to suffer. And if I open my heart to that, I did what a Bodhisattva is all about what a Lamed Vognik is all about in our tradition. Someone who has compassion for those who are born and who have to die and whose life is not easy. And when you get to see there is a way out and when you go to right understanding, right aspiration, right effort, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right concentration. These are all the ways in which we govern our awareness. And it's really important not to fall asleep. When my daughter was a little girl, and you know how kids are, they don't want to fall asleep, they want to involve you in conversations, so we can stay up a little longer, and they knew to get my number, there were always these philosophical, religious <laughs> things. So Shalvi says, Abba, when you're asleep, you can wake up, right? Right. When you're awake, can you wake up even more? So, but I was so wonderfully shocked by this question, and of course, of course I want to say, yes, I believe in that. If I didn't believe in that, it, it would be, I would go to Camus and to and the Sartre. People say, nausea, no exit. The fact that I can say, yes, you can wake up even more, and believe it, and from time to time, <clears throat> I have memory when I woke up. At the time, I'm not even thinking I'm waking up. But afterwards, oh yes, there I was. I, I, for a while, I was woken up. So, when you get to that place, how important it is. And when it hits you all at once, it is very powerful. I think if you can allow yourself just to go back to those truths and look at them again and see that it isn't as bad as you thought it is going to, it's going to be, but it's not as easy as you had hoped it would be. That's wonderful. I think our mother, the earth, is waking up to. One of the people who has helped me a great deal in updating the reality map to which the magisterium, the teaching stuff of Judaism, has to be connected again, because in past days, in past times, religions always wanted to connect with a map of reality and when the map of reality was no longer working, then, and you had to say, you need another map of reality, then they would say, you're a heretic. <laughs> and they'd bur burn you at the stake. But from time to time, just like a snake has to shed its skin, every tradition has to give up the picture of reality that it had, and invite the picture of reality that's coming in now with quantum understanding, with the way in which no matter the, no longer the, the machine model 
but the organismic model is the one that explains things a lot better. That you can see Earth and understand that you are part, that you are a living cell in, in the planet. You have to make a real shift inside. And the shift that has to happen is to go away from how people saw themselves after the Renaissance. Humanism, in which we said, we are the highest that there can be in consciousness. All the mystics and all of the deep traditions have told us that we are only the bottom feeder <laughs> when it comes to the sea of consciousness, and that there is higher and higher and, and greater and greater. So now we recognize that as cells of the global brain. We are helping the planet to wake up. What's it like when I'm waking up? Oh, if it's the alarm clock, I'm not so happy because then it, you get a shot of adrenaline and, and you're looking where you are. But there's a nice wake up when, oh, what a beautiful morning. You can look outside the window and you see a great sunrise and it's gentle and it wakes you up and it's gradual. And this gradual thing is that we are participating in. The waking up is not sudden. Thank God it's not sudden. We couldn't hack it. But we are being gradually, gradually, gradually woken up to greater collaboration, to greater connectivity with each other, even if it has to take a Zuckerberg who's going to do it with uh, <laughs> social media. But look, it was necessary because families were at one point connected with each other in tribes and in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, and now, with social mobility, our social fibers have gotten very, very small, very short. So it's important to find ways to connect more and more, because if we want to help the planet heal, we have to recognize that we lost it up with the left hemisphere, and we forgot to check in with magic, with the archetypes, with re-enchantment of the world. And so everything was like utility. So this guy goes into a forest. What a nice forest, so it's many feet of lumber here. That's the left brain. The right brain says, oh, how amazing. All the leaves, the needles of the trees, it's all alive, life, 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 life. And the boinging of that thing, you know, the echoing of that, that comes when you are also including the right hemisphere. I think that's what's so important about art. I once had a student who was telling me how dry the Buddhism was for him. He had a big guitar. I said, take it out, give me a C major. Okay, boom, 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 he goes, give me, he gives you the chord. Born in India in a royal place. Why haven't you yet made, why haven't you yet made ballads of this sort? What do you think they did in Tibet before? They had poetry of that sort, they would sing him around the campfire. That was a way in which you would take and allow, first of all, the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere to be happy. You allowed also when everybody, when all the people drummed together and were in rhythm together, you allowed the limbic brain to move out of I into we. All these things were wonderful things that were done, and I think I'm missing them, that there aren't enough celebration. Yvonne showed me a cartoon about a monk who is sitting crying, and the abbot is saying, what are you weeping for? And he points to the book and says, it's a celebrate, not celibate.
And uh, I feel I feel that we need a little more of the celebration of, of things. So, I I forgot where, where, where is Rotterdam? Where she? I shall not. I forgot to ask you for a little sake, but it's okay. Imagine, okay? I have a nice glass here, and I say, "Lechaim Rinpoche." Lechaim, lechaim. It's wonderful. <laughs> Having said what I said about celebration, I want to go to a place that I had a wonderful conversation with Reggie Ray about. If you look at the substrata of the teachings of Gautama, you know that he was in India. He was hanging out, he was doing what an Indian sadhu did for, until he proclaimed his teaching. But you could say it was a great, he was a great teacher in Hinduism. Hindus also reincorporated him in, his, in their pantheon. When the teaching had to get to China, it couldn't do it so well with the spices of India. So there was Lao Tzu and there was that wonderful teachings of yin and yang and so on and so forth. And then they sort of worked it out together so that Chinese Buddhism had its flavor. When it came to Japan, there was Shinto, the religion from before. And since they didn't want to say you can only have Buddhism and not Shinto, they integrated it with each other because Buddhism was coming from on top and Shinto was coming from on the bottom and they created the right amalgam for Japan. And in Tibet it was with Ben. How wonderful it is. I had a conversation the day before yesterday with a young man who was telling me how he was involved in a sweat lodge in preparation for Passover. <laughs> now I tell you, this, this sounds funny for a, a moment, but if you ask, you go back to the inner part, not the outer part, you would realize that we would go to a mikveh to take a purification bath before Passover in order to be ready to do that. And for him, accessible and meaningful was the sweat lodge. I can imagine doing the Passover homework and saying, Dear God, I still have some unleavened stuff inside of me that I have to get rid of. Habits that I haven't broken and so on and so forth. Sitting around with that very serious prayer that people do when the stones are hot and the water gets into steam and it gets into you. I have a feeling that whether it's Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism, there will have to be some place for, first of all, the aesthetic to make songs and to create. Why shouldn't there be a... Um, I could imagine that there should be a one-man show reciting the Dhammapada in English. I could imagine that there would be music that would be something about Avalokiteshvara. I would imagine that there could be some classical music that would be in celebration of Kanon, uh, the goddess of compassion. I could imagine that this, this could be, and I feel, unless it's going to come out 
then it may be a one or two generation phenomenon that, that he created and he wanted to be more. He was very eager. His son, God bless him, the Sakyan, he's doing good. He's making sure to keep it the way his father had. But I had a friend who was very good at rolfing and he did me 17 uh, treatments. <laughs> but at one point, Ida Rolf wanted to make him the heir of rolfing, but she didn't want him to add the innovations. So he quit and made, did the hell of work. I think if someone wants to put Rinpoche's work and keep it only in formaldehyde, how he had it, that would be wrong. <laughs> he, he broke the mold and he did what he needed to do and there will be more stuff coming. But there are some people who are motivated sometimes in changing religious things by going into conventional, politically correct thinking. That's not the basis from which you can make these changes. If I want to create a new piece of software, I have to understand in what environment I'm creating and what my CPU is like and what the basic um, machine language has to be before I start putting the system and apps on it. So it is also with this work. If it comes from real experience, you know what happens? You reach a level of more subtle vibration. And the people you're talking to, their mirror neurons tune into your mirror neurons. And even if you are not talking very much, for that moment they were able to, to, to touch that too. And if you tell them about the old, the old words that you knew, what they really mean is what I'm in touch with you right now and what I'm sharing with you right now. Can you see how from that place you would be able to create innovation that would really be true? There's another error people make, and Eve is very, very much convinced that lots of people don't pay attention to it, and that is individual, the nature of individuals, whether they're sattvic, rajasic, tamasic, I could go on with all the words, exo, endo, and mesomorph, but it's really important to know how people are in the body and how to teach them so that they being in their body could do it. The wonderful work that Maharishi did, he was able to achieve with the jocks. They knew it very well. They sit down for 20 minutes, recite the mantra and there. They were off the one, then they did it, you know? I don't know whether they were able to get to higher levels of vibration with that, but something happened to them. It marshaled that kind of thing that's good at jogging, that's good at being in the body this way and producing things. It marshaled that and created consciousness with it. That's wonderful. So there are some other people who are good at singing songs and telling stories. When I was with my friend Shlomo Karlebach and he did this wonderful, wonderful magic with people. I think of him as a genius of virtuous reality. He would tell you stories and as you heard the story there would be a longing in your heart to live like the hero of his story who was doing extraordinary moral and beautiful and loving work in the world. So that's important. There are such stories in Buddhism. Tell you two that I know that I really like a lot. 
<clears throat> they're not from Tibet, they come from Japan. Guy comes to the Roshi, Samurai. <laughs> they, can, they say that you can teach me about heaven and hell. Do it. <laughs> the Roshi looks at him, you, a Samurai? You're not even a Ronin. You're way down on the list. How could you demand this of me? He takes out the sword. He said, that's hell. That's heaven. What a wonderful story. You see, at this moment, you got it. You got what, what Shlomo was doing in a way, you know? To recognize that when you are in your ego, which is broken as he broke it for him, and the, and the soul was able to come out, how wonderful that was. Another story. The patriarch wanted to make sure the sutras would get printed in China. And it's very hard to print in Chinese in wood blocks. You had to carve them in mirror writing and so on and so forth. And he needed to get money together and he got the money together. And just as it was about to go and, and have him done, there was a flood. We know what that's like in Boulder. <laughs> and he took the money and he helped the victims of the flood. Again he went around collecting money, collecting money, he got it together. And he is ready to print again, and this time is a famine. And he goes ahead and helps the victims of the famine. Finally, the third time around, he's able to get them printed. And those who know say that the first two editions were better. <laughs> but notice right now what happened inside of you. There is a, a, an awakening of, of of heart and compassion, and even the humor of that, and that is so wonderful. <laughs> At one time, I would be very clear to talk about paradigm shift, and I have a feeling it's not working that way. Paradigm shift would mean that it shifted quick. And so I went back to look at what they call in history of ideas, the Axial Age. And it took about 400 years from 600 BC to 200 BC for a shift to happen in humanity, the global. There was Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, there was Zechariah, there was Jeremiah, Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel, there was Zarathustra, there was Mahavira, there was the Buddha, there was Lao Tzu, there was Confucius, and some blip came down. The other people in the world weren't able to receive it, but they saw it and they hung in with it, meditated on it, elaborated on it, and from there they derived but the beacon of the earth mind was trying to inspire them at that point that you have to shift from the way in which you saw things and to see them differently. But it doesn't happen overnight. And so the mind, the reason goes very fast. Life is much, much slower. So I want to say to those of you who feel that the changes that are needed aren't coming so fast and that things are going sort of back and forth. At one point I wanted to write a book under the name of Meditations Between Contractions, <laughs> which is when a baby is about to be born and the contractions, you can't think much about it, you're too busy. So are we from crisis to crisis. But in between, there is a time, a little Shabbos, a little reflection time, to be able to say, but it's getting better. It is getting better, but it's not shown yet above the horizon. So I want to urge you to have patience with it. 
What can we do to hurry that, that process? I want to tell you something. Every time I spoke here, I raised that thing, and I'm going to raise it again. We need an empirical laboratory for going over the skillful means of how to use the mind and meditation and contemplation in a much more direct, powerful way. And there are now also some help. You know, some of you think that um, to ask for mechanical or some other help is not a good idea. But I would like to see what happens when somebody gets a um, uh, stroke to blink in the right uh, speed that would get me into the theta wave and there to go into my meditative thing and to see where it would take me. Maybe I could do in 20 minutes what I need to do. But if you're going to prescribe to people three months, six months, a year, years of meditation, we can't afford it. So I would like to see that there would be a possibility to somehow coordinating with other groups, other people, the Noetics Institute for instance, and to say we want to create an institute for the empirical study of skillful means to hot uh, house spirituality for people on the planet. I have so much more to say, but I, my battery is out and getting. I don't have much more energy. I just want to say this about blessings. I think of him holding the dorji at that, at that time. Could you think of what you would need to get some of the obstacles for waking up for spiritual growth, for more compassion out of the way? Could you think of what is it that you would need that would, if that were not there, you would be able to do it so much better. And I'm going to pray that this happen. And that all those, when I spoke with His Holiness, He was so much into angels, so I'm going to sing the angel song. B'Shem Hashem B'Shem Hashem Elokei Yisrael Mi Mini Mi Chael Mi Smoli Gabriel Mi Ufanai Oriel Mi Achorai Raphael, Vial Roshi, Vial Roshi, Shechi Nazel. Amen. I never marked on the curve here because I believe that all of you are above average. 